Hi there, it's Jeff here. In this short video, I thought I'd take a look at seven different schools of thought and economics and, and just mention the ways in which you can bring these ideas in to get help get top marks in your exams. Because certainly referencing schools of thought helps you analyse policies from different perspectives. Examiners like that. And it also gives you that little extra layer of depth and sophistication to your answer if you're using Keynesian economics to discuss policy making uh, in the Great Depression or you're using some Austrian thinking to evaluate the efficacy of bank bailouts in 2008 onwards. That is a different layer of sophistication which examiners certainly value as well as helping to ensure a slightly more balanced answer which is what examiners are looking for for top level evaluation. So here is a quick journey through I think seven schools of thought. Classical and neoclassical have lumped together Classical economists emphasise self-regulation, driven by Adam Smith's invisible hand. They believe in uh, market principles, the price mechanism, minimal gov government or state intervention, arguing that free markets left to their own devices lead to optimal allocations of scarce resources in the long run. And you associate this kind of thinking with Smith, the wealth of nations, Ricardo's theory of comparative advantage and trade, and Marshall's. Uh, understanding of consumer producer surplus as measures of welfare. And typically, of course, when you're using, uh, if you're discussing comparative advantage or the price mechanism, you're drawing or leaning heavily on neoclassical economics. The UK government, prior to the Labour government coming in in 2024, had a strong emphasis post-Brexit on trying to negotiate free trade deals with Australia and New Zealand and other countries, essentially a classical approach. Keynesians, on the other hand, advocate for active counter-cyclical intervention to help stabilise economies, particularly in a downturn, particularly during a recession. So they focus on the key concepts of aggregate demand, consumer confidence or animal spirits, and the role of demand in maintaining high, late, high rates of, of employment. And of course, we associate Keynesian economics with John Maynard Keynes. So in particular, one strong element, if you're, if you're talking about fiscal policy in an A-level exam, Bring in a Keynesian perspective, the concept of the Keynesian fiscal multiplier, which is the idea of the use of changes in government spending or taxation to achieve a given percentage or increase in aggregate demand of GDP. Real world example would be the furlough scheme, an 80% wage subsidy in the UK during the COVID pandemic, which helped to subsidise wages and helped to protect employment and prevent a deflationary depression. Monetarists, of course, have a different perspective, a different school of thought. They argue that inflation is mainly a monetary phenomenon and that the central banks should keep a steady control of the money supply and credit availability. We associate monetarism with Friedman and others. And again, whenever you're talking about the Phillips curve or anchoring inflation expectations or the operation of monetary policy, oftentimes you'll be using monetarist thinking. So good examples more recently, the Bank of England's introduction of quantitative easing in 2009 after the global financial crisis. More recently, the Bank of England raising interest rates two years ago to combat inflation and the extent to which uh, they've been prepared to use uh, uh, QE, for example, during the pandemic. Austrian economics is really interesting. They emphasise individual choice, the key role for entrepreneurship, and they're very sceptical towards centralised planning. They believe, Austrian economics believes in the spontaneous order and the importance of free markets. We associate their work with the, the writing of von Mises, Friedrich Hayek and Joseph Schumpeter. And crucially, whenever you're talking about the role of intervention in markets, whenever you're talking about the concept of creative destruction in contestable markets or the arguments for against state bailouts, you'll really be bringing in at some point an Austrian perspective well, recently, deregulation policies in many countries, of course, all the way back to the 1980s and 1990s, but in the UK context, sectors such as energy, transport and banking have been deregulated, in some cases, um, in addition to privatisation, and with mixed results. Behavioural economics, most students love this kind of stuff. And of course, the crucial thinking behind behavioural is to challenge the assumption of rational decision making making a study of or application of the many numerous psychological and cognitive influences on our behaviour, 
two of which include anchoring and loss aversion. And we associate it with Daniel Kahneman, recently departed us, sadly, and Richard Thaler, the founder of or the thinking of Nudge. So again, whenever you're talking about policy, uh, you can use experiments, randomised controlled trials to show biases in decision making, or you can bring in the idea of behavioural nudges to change consumer behaviour in trying to get us to save more for a pension, adopt healthier diets, and reduce instances of antisocial behaviour. And then there's feminist, feminist economics, of course, really important. Oftentimes we bring in a feminist perspective when we're highlighting inequalities, discrimination, and other market failures in the labour market, in particular the exclusion of unpaid labour. Notable thinkers include Claudia Golden, recent Nobel Prize winner, and Mariana Mazzucato. So a really good example of feminist approaches will be the ongoing gender pay gap in the UK and other countries, and the kind of underpinning of the impact of childcare support policies, including reforms to increase free childcare hours for working parents. And then we have post-Keynesian economics, finally. Well, these build on Keynesian ideas, but emphasise in particular uh, financial markets and, and crucially, uh, the impact of policy, globalisation uh, and other, other developments on uncertainty, fragility and income distribution. So typically post-Keynesian economics, which largely lies outside the syllabus, but it's really interesting, offers a critique of mainstream models. They argue that too many models are overly simplistic, built on unrealistic assumptions. We can go back to Joan Robinson in the 1930s and Hyman Minsky, financial instability hypothesis, as two good examples of post-Keynesian heterodox thinking. And a really key idea there is to understand the causes of financial crises, and in particular, the role that highly leveraged commercial banking systems can have in creating economic instability. So real-world examples would include the regulations that were introduced post-2008, perhaps not hard enough, uh, the, the effects of a decade of low interest rates, and also the wider consequences of financial innovation, such as subprime loans and credit default swaps. If you're watching the big short, you'll get a feel for post-Keynesian critique of financial market innovation. Either way, if you can bring into your answer at A-level maybe one, maybe two, possibly three different schools of thought, it will give your answers and your papers extra layers of complexity and nuanced evaluation. And that can make a difference and help you get the top grades. Well, thanks for joining in. Take care. See you soon.